Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Ivan Oberon's Money Matters. It is Thursday, July 31st already, and uh, we're, we're going to get going here in just a couple of minutes. I'm excited for our special guest tonight and what we're going to be talking about. But man, it's, it's just been a busy week. If you guys have been following anything that we've been doing, uh, you know, we've been, we've been out there looking at properties. We were in Corona Del Mar yesterday in Laguna Beach. Uh, we have a $1.2 million property under contract out there that, that we're going to uh, sell for about 2.5 million and we got an even bigger one going. And I think one of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight could be an, an alternatively good, um, you know, alternate exit strategy. Uh, and specifically what we're going to be talking about tonight is going to be the power of seller financing and all those different components. And tonight we're going to have Dave Franke with us and he is an expert. He's been in the business for over 30 years and in, engaged in all kinds of different aspects of real estate. So he's got an extreme uh, uh, amount of knowledge in not only this subject, but any other uh, you know real estate type, type um, uh, strategies. If you have any other questions that come up throughout the, the webinar, feel free to ask him. Uh, because he definitely has the experience and one of the things that he's he's focusing on a lot right now is the seller carry owner financing type strategy and not just for and and i'll let i'll let him get into it but uh you know it's it's not just for the real estate investor it's it's a great alternate strategy for realtors and i think more and more realtors are, are picking up on this as as, a, as another way to be able to add more value to their clients and more more dollars to their bottom line by being creative and being able to sell properties in a different way, especially in this in this realm where there there's more and more people who are not getting qualified for conventional financing, and and are desperate and they and they and they want to be able to to you know find alternate strategies that people aren't telling them about. So without further ado, Dave Franke is here with us, and I think he's got a, he's got a couple of his team members along along for the ride. Uh, so you guys are going to be very well served tonight. How are you guys tonight? We're great. How are you? Uh, we're well doing great. You know, just a little, a little thrown back by this this last uh, week and a half or two weeks of humidity that we've been having. You know, I'm not I'm not used to this in Camarillo. We usually we usually get a you know have our own little microclimate here where it's you know it's nice and warm and comfortable and not not too humid, not too not too hot. But it's uh it's a little crazy right now. I feel like I'm in the tropics. Well, you can always be in Phoenix and enjoy the 115 degrees with the, uh, <laughs> what do they call it, low humidity? Yes. Well, uh, you know, that's, uh, thank you for reminding me that, that there's there's absolutely no reason to complain. And, and I'm really not complaining. I, I enjoy it for the most part. The, the, the hardest part for me is that this kind of weather specifically just makes me want to be at the beach. And and it, so it makes it more difficult to focus on my on the work at hand. But uh, yeah, no, I I hear you. I'd, I'd rather not be suffering in that 115 degree temperature. I don't know how you guys do it. It's interesting. <laughs> well, what are we going to be talking about to guy, tonight, guys? I'm gonna, I'm going to change this over to you here, Dave, the because I know you have a, a good slide deck prepared for us. And I'll turn this over. Just accept it when you get it, and uh, then we should be able to to see you here in just a second. Tell me when you see it, Ivan. Okay, I think it's shifting. Do you see it? Let me get rid of mine. Yep, there you are. Okay, let me open this up some more. And I'll get rid of this here. Let's see, how do I minimize this here? Yep, it's right here. Okay. Yeah, it's not it's not quite fitting the whole the whole screen here. It's a little it's a little cut off. What what are you missing? Well, it it looks like it's it's like I'm zoomed in too far. Oh, okay. 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 Wait a minute. Is that better? If you can go smaller or larger, left and up would would be better. So I guess smaller. Is that better? Yes, but now you got now you got to pull it up up into the left corner. I don't know if I can do that. If you can, if you can do that. There we go. That's 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 getting better. Keep going. A little bit more. A little more. That's better. Okay. Okay. We're gonna. I guess we'll call that good. Good deal. Okay. <laughs> As I mentioned to you earlier, this is the first time I've done a PowerPoint or a webinar, so uh, I guess everybody just please bear with us. Yeah, absolutely. You know, welcome to the age of technology. I guess so. 
That's why Ryan's with us. He's uh, kind of walking us through this. All right. Well, why don't we go so, ahead and just dive in, guys? Okay. So Pat and I just came off a call, and I'm with Pat Bill. She's with Greenbox Mortgage, and my name is Dave Franicki, and I'm with Capstone Capital, and we're both focusing on the seller carry arena uh, because we see there's a need for that to help help people along. Absolutely, the laws changed in Jan in January, and now um, people who want to sell their own property with owner financing uh, have some hoops to jump through. And Absolutely. Yeah, so, and I don't know if we ever got into this day when we when we were at uh, the David Fagan event, but one of the things I focused on for about a year was was uh, you know, one aspect of owner financing, uh, where I would go and I'd get seller properties under contract, and then I basically would just market them for buyers and and bring the buyers in their down payment. I would collect the spread in the, in the middle and turn all the contracts over to them and and basically move on to the next one. But after January, man, things things just started getting a little bit a little bit hairier. So. Um, I kind of I kind of slowed down and got away from it. Yeah, to your point, we just came off a call with the Seller Finance Coalition, and they are now setting up a, a really heavy lobby in D.C. and bringing this to the powers to be's attention because what what we're finding out with this Dodd Frank is that it's hurting people instead of helping people. It's hurting the neighborhoods, the smaller price point homes. People can't even get into them because everybody's afraid of the laws mm. and, and what's connected with. The Dodd Frank and the Consumer Prote Consumer Financial Protection Board, where it's more invasive than the IRS. Oh yeah, yeah, I believe it. So, so what we're looking at here, Ivan, is basically showing people how not to be concerned about what's going on in Washington with this, how to circumvent or work with the laws that are there, so that everybody's free and clear and, and good to go. Mm -hmm. And more specifically, then, how the benefits of seller carry will help the buyers, the sellers, the investor benefits, and even the agents. It just, it'll create, uh, do a lot of good for them. Sure. So, and you know, you can, you can sell your home for more and there's, there's no um, appraisal to worry about and, and right. no, uh, quite frequently, no repairs that you have to do. So it, it really is, uh, Okay. Yeah, and there's there's a big power behind that, right? Because you know, yeah. in many cases, what you're selling, what you're saying is is true. Because in many cases, you're you're selling the monthly payment. You're not necessarily selling the end price. You know, that that person is. I mean, that they are concerned because eventually they might have to refinance if that's if that's the strategy. Uh, right. and, and maybe you guys are doing it a little bit differently, but you know, the way that I was doing it, they had to they had to basically refinance in two years. And that, that was one of the Dodd-Frank issues because I couldn't put a balloon payment on these things anymore. And so it's like, are we going to do just a super long escrow or what are we going to do? Right. And but when you're when you're doing a little bit longer owner financing scenarios, then the 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 price of the house doesn't matter as much. So you can get more for it because, you know, you're offering a service as long as the, the monthly payment works out. I mean that 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 seller can definitely you know have a better bottom line at the end. Well, and very frankly, it's uh, it's it's great for people who own their own businesses uh, and their accountants did a great job, so now they don't qualify, unfortunately, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Own, or folks who have some sort of bruise on their credit from the from the downturn and losing homes and stuff like that. You know, so there there are lots of reasons for a seller carry. Yeah, and I think it's less. <clears throat> excuse me, it's less and less. You know, a, a I don't know a dirty word where where I mean not a dirty word, but people people were used to be kind of ashamed, like oh I can't qualify for a loan, there must be something wrong with me. And the reality is, is that there are many more reasons. Yeah, sure, credit plays a role. There are many other reasons why people don't qualify, and that was one of the things that I would tell people is like, hey, look, man, it's, I understand. <clears throat> I'm a I'm a small business owner. I don't qualify for a mortgage right now. You know, sure. I bought I bought mine in 07 and I don't want to talk about that, but but you know, things have changed since then and I started my own businesses and different things and, and you know, forget about qualifying for a loan. And to your point, Ryan, who was just here, he works on the entrepreneurial side and, and banding entrepreneurs together. And this is just so in sync because you know, people don't want to rely upon the outside job market and yet when you become an entrepreneur you are a great law-abiding citizen by following the tax code, but that precludes, precludes you from getting a loan. And that's, that's, it's counterintuitive when you think about it. Right. Yeah. And then it even affects realtors because they don't, can't, uh, 
can't be approved for a loan. So it's just it's, it's just a circle that just keeps going on and on. But what it does is just it helps everybody. So from a, an investor standpoint, they can sell their home for a premium. So they can sell it in less time and with less effort. The same applies to the agents. It just mm -hmm. it's just a good cycle for everybody. Yeah. So it, as you look at this, Ivan, I mean, you work in this venue. Um, you're you're a problem solver. Would you agree? Yes, and uh, you know, I I guess the bigger problems you have, the the more money you get paid, is what they say. Right. You got to think outside the box and, and just go from there. So what we're looking at, as you as you look at uh, January 10th, which was the big end date, it's what was there last year doesn't work this year. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, you just you have to find a solution. So. Well, the, the buyers who, uh, there are a lot of buyers who can't buy, and so there is a pent-up demand that sure. need, to, need to find a solution for those people, as we mentioned. Um, you know, it's like 40%, I believe, is the statistic of people who would have qualified last year, don't this year. Where are those people? They've got money. They, they, could, they would have qualified for the payment, and unfortunately, uh, Dodd-Frank yanked their home out from under them. So here's a way for them to have their home now. And we've got sellers who can't sell for one reason or another. Sometimes they're asking too much or sometimes there's some repairs that the buyer would be willing to make themselves. And they do a little carry back and they can do it. And you sure. know, Ivan, the big thing on this too is let's say a seller has a significant amount of equity in their home. This is a question for you. How much, let's say you have a, in California, it's not uncommon to have a four or $500,000 home. Would that be true? <laughs> yes, very true. Okay. So what would a typical seller do when they, if they got cash, put it in the bank and get maybe 0.02%? Right, right. So with seller carry, it's not unusual to get 7 or 8% return on your money. So, and it's, so it's secure in a you know, first lien position. I mean, it's a great move for retirees where they can you know, essentially change their lifestyle. Yeah, and and expl explain that a little bit a little bit more, Dave, because you know here here's I think what a lot of a lot of people think. Well, I mean, there's just so many different ways to do seller financing and owner financing. So what you're talking about there is you got somebody. You know, let's let's use Bob as an example from uh, that, uh, that who spoke at the Note Summit, right? And right. He's, he's out there with you, and one of the things that he said that that you know was was kind of an eye opener for me. He's a he's a realtor, and he said that you know all my all my clients uh, do seller financing whether they want to or not. And I was yep. like, "What do you mean by that?" He said, "Well, if even if they don't want to do seller financing and I have a buyer, I'll just have he has other investors that will then come in. They'll buy the property so that they can do uh, create a seller finance note for that buyer and get that return on their money, like you're talking about." Correct, and it, and it even goes this way. Um, I was talking to an agent here a few weeks ago, and she says, I want to do seller carry uh, for my seller. And her biggest concern is that the buyer is going to cash them out in two or three years. And I said, you know what? That is not a problem because there are plenty of notes out there around the country. And you can buy them at a really, really good discount, which will get you a high yield, so that the note might have a face, a coupon rate of, or an interest rate of 8%. But by the time they're discounted, you can you'll get a yield of 11, 12, and 13 percent. So it just it, it all comes full circle. So you've got your sellers who may or may not want to carry the paper, and if they don't, that's okay. Then you've got your outside IRA investor who might want to just take the seller's place, and or um, the, down the road as the seller moves out, other people move in. So it's just it, it just benefits everybody in the whole process. Right, and that's and that's what it's all about, right? It's win, win, win. Right, right, and it's and it's a way where the market is going now. Um, I saw an article in California. Um, it was the June market in California. It, it showed it's starting to level off. Have you noticed that or heard that at all? That the market is starting to level off in terms of appreciation. Uh, well, I think it's it's slowing down, but uh, right. I think it's still going up. Yeah. Well, in in Phoenix, um, what we've seen. Starting last July, the phones stopped ringing or slowed down dramatically, and now we have flipped from a seller's market to a buyer's market. Mm -hmm. And appreciation is now capped at maybe three to four percent. That's what the projections are for the rest of the year. And Phoenix, a lot of times, leads the nation in terms of what trends are happening. 
So hmm. that in line with the, you know, the, the first quarter GDP of the, uh, of the country, it's, uh, it just it creates a whole bunch of opportunity. Hey Dave, not to not to derail you here, uh, but I just got another another comment saying that uh, if there's any way that we can make the slides a little smaller again, because they're getting they're still getting cut off a little bit, and I know there's probably some valuable information on there. Okay, let me see what I can do here. Is that better? Keep going a little bit. There. Well, it, it's got to go to the left of the screen. And maybe sh and maybe shrink it if you can. Okay. Oh, now I got big again. <laughs> it's all right. Don't don't worry. We'll we'll take our time. That way. There you go. Now it's getting better. There. Okay. Now now pull it up. Oh, okay. No. Now it went now it went back over. Okay. So now now I can see the whole slide, but it's in the lower right hand corner. The, the you know the the actual white part there you go now it's now it's in the middle now bring the, now bring the whole thing up and, and make the just make the white part a little bit bigger okay Oops. there 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 we go now we can see the whole thing okay okay good deal <laughs> good deal okay and then you know the other thing that's been happening and, and it, you know it's not again I'm our perspective is Phoenix but it's actually nationally because of the home ownership declining, uh, or home ownership has declined because of the, of the millennials and all the people that are sitting on the sidelines. So it's creating some challenges. And again, it's, but it's more specifically, it's creating opportunities. Here's the slide I was talking about to the California market. Did you see this, Ivan, at all before? No. From Property Radar? Mm -mm. But it, it's, it's in line with what we've been watching to, or, or following dramatically from this from our vantage point here. Um, but as you look at seller carry, what it's doing is it gives everybody a competitive edge. It gets the buyers in the home right away. Um, you're, you're what, in your early, late 30s, Ivan? 36. Okay. So think of all the people your age who may not have a home, but they want to get into a home. Right. And they've got kids and they can't get established. With sell or carry, it gives them the opportunity to get in the home of their dreams. They might pay a little bit more money, but overall, they're not throwing money out, out, the, out the window with their rent and their right. spend bill appreciation and whatever the case might be on that. Yeah, well, I mean, I have a, I have a friend who, who's uh, in his early 20s, and that's exactly right. You know, he's, he's recently married, he's got a young kid, and uh, doesn't really qualify for for financing right now but he's been putting some money aside so and we're here in california so again we you need a big number but he's got about 30 grand saved up i mean you, that's that's i think enough to get into a, a decent owner finance deal here yeah and and what we've been recommending for for sellers is that you want to get a reasonable down payment from a buyer um and pat can probably address that better than i can but you know typically we're looking for 15 to 20 percent down to give them give them some incentive to stay with the home and treat it like it is their home? Well, sh certainly 15 to 20 percent is very nice for the seller. Sometimes the buyers don't have quite that much. If they're yeah. really strong buyers, um, maybe the seller would just carry back uh, with a lower down payment, a little bit higher interest rate. So it still it still will work if, if that payment works for that. Yeah, and, and I think I think you have to factor in and consider the price points that you're operating within because you're right. absolutely right. In certain price points, it's going to be very difficult to find a buyer that's got twenty percent down. I mean, that can that can, you know, there, there there's there's some guys I know that you know operate in the in the you know, under hundred thousand dollar space, and sometimes it's it's hard to get those types of buyers to come up with you know five thousand, ten thousand dollars. Right. Well, now, to a point to your point on that, though, Ivan, um, from, as a note consultant in mm -hmm. this arena, the the heavier or the bigger the down payment, if in down the road, if the seller chooses to sell that note, the bigger the down payment, the less the discount. So, sure. from the seller's point of view, it is important to get as much down as possible. And that's oh, what absolutely. We, yeah. No, you know, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. And if and if you're and if you're expecting them to refinance the note at some point, say they have a credit issue, or say they have to do something, say they need, you know, to to get some tenure in their jobs, uh, you know, to get qualified, whatever it is, and your ultimate goal is to get them to refinance into a a more conventional type loan, 
Well, that down payment amount is gonna is gonna play a factor. So if That's correct. you know yeah. if you're only if you're if you're letting them move in with only five percent down, but you know a conventional lender is gonna require fifteen or twenty, then you're in a pretty sticky situation unless you know th and guarantee somehow assured that they're going to be putting aside another another you know 10 to 15 percent over the next two years to be able to get qualified well and you want to set them up for success rather than setting them up for failure absolutely right i mean that's i mean the bottom line is what's in it for them how can they win you don't want anybody to get hurt and you just want everybody to, to have a win-win-win solution all the way throughout yeah and sometimes that means you have to say no that's exactly correct. Well, and that's the purpose of qualifying that buyer, too. That's, that's in fact, what Greenbox does is we qualify the, the buyer for the payment, make sure that they can they qualify for that payment, give a whole big uh, package to the seller with a synopsis of what the credit is and what the issues are and what's going on with that buyer today, and then the seller makes the decision whether or not they want to lend to that to that buyer. Mm -hmm. Ivan, have you done seller carry yourself in your real estate career? Have you worked with that through that at all? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's 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 kind of where I'm where you know well, I'm talking through my experiences here. Okay. That's that's how I know what I know because I've been through it. Yeah. Okay. 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 And what have you found with this with the uh, buyers? How quickly do they check, typically? Uh, refinance out and cash out the sellers? Well, typically it, between the 15 to 24 month okay. mark. Okay. Okay. And are the sellers happy or sad that they're cashed out? No, they're happy. And they see, happy. and see, that's why, that's why what, what I was doing and focusing on is different than what you guys are doing and where you're playing, where you're, where you're playing is a lot more creative. Um, but it, it, I mean, that was, that was the condition. It's just like, look, we, we don't want to carry this for more than 24 months. If you can okay. get qual if you can get qualified in 12 months, we're happy with that. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't really being looked at as an investment vehicle like this, like what you guys were oh, okay. talking about. Okay. It was more of a, you know, I need to sell my house. It's, it, I want an alternative to sell my house. This sounds like a good alternative. Let's see if this can work. But I need, but I want my money out as, as fast as I can, and and you know, sure, I'll go twenty four months. Okay. okay. Well, of course, they can always uh, sell that note, especially if it's cured for two years. It'd be less of a discount. Mm hmm. Have you also found, Ivan, that um, if there were ten homes on the street, and nine of the ten are going to, are just offering traditional terms, meaning just go to the bank and get your money. And the home that's offering seller financing, it sells faster. Well, you know, I wasn't in the space too much dealing with realtors too much, so I can't I, I can't really comment on that. Other than than to say that I, I believe that it is more attractive when you at least offer that option. And from what I've heard from other realtors, you know, since that are offering it, they're they're. They have more more buyers, more clients. They, right. you know, they're increasing their bottom found, line. Um, we look at seller carry like like it's an amenity, just like granite or, or mm -hmm. travertine or whatever the case might be. So by offering that amenity, you can also sell your home for a premium, and the people are willing to pay for that. So it's it's a win. You know, it works well that way also for the uh, for the sellers. And and I think one of the things that I found is that it's very much. The success rate in what you're talking about is definitely driven by the market in which you're doing it in, because it's True. because it's not as attractive in in certain markets. That's correct. Well, uh, think about in the uh, in the late '90s, early 2000s, when all you had to do was be moving and breathing, and you could get a mortgage. Nobody was doing seller carry then because it just didn't it it wasn't needed. But today, it's needed. And so the sellers get their homes sold faster, and the buyers get to move in, and, and it's a payment they can afford. And almost always, though, the buyers are astute enough to realize that if they save money or the property value goes up um, in, a, in a certain amount of time, they'll refinance back out of that seller, and then they'll get their money back then. You know, and one, one way of looking at it also, Ivan, if there's, let's say you're three weeks into an escrow, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, 
the the lender comes back and said, oh, by the way, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, you don't qualify. What do you do? You got to have an option, you know. But it, 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 in essence, that whole traditional sale has just gone out the window. Sure. So at that point, while they the seller may not have been totally up for seller carry, they might then consider that, and 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 basically they become the bank, and everything, and then you just you move through the move through the process. What's going on here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> there, we go. there you go. Yeah, <laughs> but but in essence, then the seller just takes the the place of the bank and just and just uh, gets rid of the sale. Now the benefit of that is you could probably be able to stay within the same time frame that you would have had with the with your contract because the seller is willing to step up to the plate and make it happen. Okay. Uh, so it it works extremely well that way. So in essence, in this case, like you know, as the slide says, it's just the seller becomes the bank. The seller does is the un, is the underwriter, and mm-hmm. Pat can fill in the blanks on how that works. Oh yes, well we put we contact the well the buyer contacts us, and we do all of the loan preparation like a tra- any traditional loan. So we put together that whole package. The difference is it doesn't go to an underwriter; it goes to the seller, and the seller reviews it and decides mm-hmm. whether they want to move forward or not. Okay, seems a lot more. Streamline. Yes, it gives a lot more control to the parties too. And then now, going back to your uh, Bob Zachmeyer example, if the seller doesn't want to do it, we have several investors lined up who jump in, and basically um, the seller says yes, I'll carry. But at the closing table, the investor takes the seller out, and then mm-hmm. they get that, that higher rate of return. And they're happy, happy, happy to do that. And that's typically, and that might even fit in line with your your listener audience, um, where in fact. They have a Roth IRA. It's a great play for a Roth to get, you know, a, a guaranteed rate of return and, and a really strong investment behind it. Sure, because you're not you're not necessarily buying a note at that point. You're you're actually creating the note. That's correct. Mm-hmm. That's correct. And you, and the other benefit with Dodd Frank now, um, if you're trying to sell a note and it's not Dodd Frank friendly or Dodd Frank compliant, it could in effect uh, depreciate the value of that note. Hmm. Uh, when the full loan package is created by the lender, the seller has that, and they've got that to give to the note buyer okay. down the road. So it, it works out well um, for guaranteeing their return, minimizing the discount, and then for the buyer of the note, they know that they're not going to have any issues down the road with any kind of Dodd-Frank inquiries because they, the seller or the buyer meets the criteria of the Fannie Mae 1003. Well, and I would just say I know, and we all know, I think, that not everybody has to be qualified for a seller carry back if the, um, there's, there's exceptions to that rule. However, I would suggest that it, it would be a good idea, just as Dave was mentioning, to go ahead and have that buyer qualified so that you've got a more saleable note. Okay, so let, let's get into that a little bit. So you, you talk about, uh, you know, finding, getting a... a uh, se- qualify for seller carry back. R- explain that a little bit. You know what? What is the process? Who Who are you looking for? How difficult is that? Well, you're you're looking for the person who, um, for whatever reason, doesn't qualify for the traditional mortgage. Mm-hmm. So, a self-employed person like you and me, we I'm not going to qualify for a loan. You just said you're not going to qualify for a loan. People who own businesses today have a very hard time proving their income, and it's very hard to get a traditional loan if you own a business. There are many, many people who uh, lost properties through bankruptcies, foreclosures, short sales, um, and unfortunately sometimes people get divorced or have health issues and things go awry there. They've lost their jobs, whatever, so they've lost a home. And Mm -hmm. so they've got that on their credit. But everything else is good, and their credit scores have come up, but they've still got that blemish on their credit that a traditional loan is not going to work out for them. So seller carry back is what works. So we put that whole package together, as I mentioned before, give that to the seller. The seller decides whether or not they want to go forward with that, uh, giving that loan to that particular person, okay. the, the underwriter. And leaving, leaving credit aside for a minute, are you, are you doing a full – you know, debt-to-income analysis, are you doing job history yes. analysis, all that kind of stuff? Yes, 
everything to do with that person, income, outgo, assets, um, all the whole financial picture, including the credit report. Are you, are you checking their Facebook for lewd pictures? No. <laughs> No, I haven't, haven't, haven't gone, gone quite that far yet. Okay, got it. <laughs> not quite yet. You know, because because uh, it's it's affecting people's lives apparently, costing them their jobs and relationships, and you know, pe people are people are man, they better they, they they should be more careful. But in all reality, you know what what we're looking for. I mean, you many 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 people have a lot of baggage. That's okay, but where are they where are they now in the last two or three years? Do they have a good job? Are they are they paying their their bills? Are they you know all those factors that make them into a really good credit risk? Every, the other items will go away in time, but if, as long as they're good to go now over the last two or three years, they're you know they're fine. Even if they switch jobs, it doesn't matter because they got the cash flow there. They got a track record of you know of what their income is, and it's 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 a non-issue. They're good. They're good solid buyers. Okay. And is there? You know, is there a space that you guys are operating in specifically as far as price points go? You know, because because houses over there in, in Phoenix, Scottsdale, all those areas, I mean, they they can range from the the low hundreds into the multiple millions as well. So, Correct. what what are what are you seeing as far as that? It's It'll start? work in any area. Uh, there's a lot of folks in the higher end. When I say higher end, over over you know in the seven figures, the buyers have the same scenarios where they just don't qualify, but they have a lot of, I'm going to call it mattress money. So that, that mm -hmm. works well, but it's, 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 I don't know, it could be anywhere from the hundred thousand dollars space to the million space to the two million space. It really doesn't matter because the buyers have the same issues, no matter what, where they're at in the spectrum. Absolutely true. It's, Except for some of those high end buyers have a lot more money to put down. That's correct. Or pay no. cash. That's correct. That's correct. And then a lot of them have the issues that we were talking about. Um, you know, I, I personally know people who walked away from mortgages just because they knew that they weren't worth it anymore. And they said, you know, why should I keep paying on this? And so hmm. uh, that's on their credit. But they've got now they've everything's come back and they've got credit scores improved. You know, some of them are in the upper sevens and and you can you can see that they're a good candidate for a seller carryback. Okay. And you know, another great candidate in this, ar this arena, in the 2009, 10, 11, well, I don't know what the home prices were out in your area in LA or San Diego, California area, but here there was a lot of product that was in the 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 range. Mm. And that stuff has now doubled. So these landlords, mm -hmm. they've got a lot of equity sitting on the plate. They're not getting a real return on the equity sure. right now. Um, and a lot of them with that, they pay cash from the outset. So they've got, you know, it's all cash sitting there. But they're tired of dealing with the tenants and the trash and the toilets and all the, the negative issues that are tied to being a landlord. Mm -hmm. That being said, what we've been able to show them is, is that they can, in effect, sell the property, defer the capital gains, and basically, just check out. Just just get a just get an annuity, uh, because the rate of return is pretty strong, and in some cases, it's better than what they were getting uh, as a landlord. Okay. So, so how, how are these? To do so that. so by by sell the property and defer to capital gains, you're you're talking about just because they're carrying the note. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. And it becomes an annuity because the the a servicer handles the payments. The note holder or the landlord just gets a gets a debit to their account or a credit to their account. A prime example is I met with a, a gentleman uh, in Scottsdale. He had a home there in an Anthem, and he has a sailboat down in the Keys. Mm -hmm. And he's Australian, and all he wants to do is sail around the Keys, but he doesn't want to deal with being a landlord. <laughs> so he's selling his rental property now, knowing that he'll take a you know he's going to do seller seller carry. Mm -hmm. He'll take the paper and he'll his checking account or his savings account will get a check every month and he's good to go and doesn't have to worry about it so he's, he's it's a lifestyle that he's he he's feeding by just doing the seller carry and not worry about the daily management headaches okay and making income on that note that's that's a beautiful place to be sure 
the other thing is that, you know, a lot of these folks um, that own property that they can do a seller carry back on would like to pass that something tangible on to their children. They can, the children can inherit, inherit this note and the income stream that goes with it. And they, they're not stuck with having to figure out whether to sell that property or deal with the tenants or, you know, do all of that stuff. They just sit back and collect a check every month. Okay. And and obviously there's going to be different lengths of terms and different things that are that are you know agreed to between the two parties, right? So some some of them might have a five year note, another one might be eight, fifteen, twenty year note, whatever whatever it might be, depending sure. on what the two parties agree to. Sure, absolutely. And to that point, uh, again, according to Dodd Frank, the amortization period can't go beyond thirty years. Mm -hmm. um, you can't have balloons. Um, you can bump their interest rate a little bit. I think it's a maximum of 2% over the life of the loan. Uh, you can typically set up the interest rate about six points over what the pre prevailing rate might be now. So that could take it up as high as probably 11 right now. Okay. Um, those are the variables that are in there, but you, well, you go ahead. I'm sorry, but depending on where you start with your interest rate. Right. So, and that, that's kind of driven by whether whether you're an investor or whether whether you're selling uh, a couple properties. Um, there are some guidelines on that. Um, but if if you're an owner selling your home to a consumer, um, the guidelines are a little bit looser. You don't you don't have to stick right with that interest rate. But you can do an adjustable rate note. Um, it, it has to be fixed for the first five years, and then it can adjust. Mm -hmm. And there are caps that are um, suggested by the CFPB as well, um, but almost always at the end, but by, by the five-year point, they're going to refi out of that. Anyway. Okay. And then as far as structuring the note, Ivan, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really good to work with somebody that is familiar with what it's going to take should the seller decide to sell that note later. And that being said, uh, and yes, you know, here we're, we're promoting the 15 to 20% down, depends upon the price point, you know, where the buyers are and how much money they have. But it, it actually benefits the seller to create two notes. Okay. Meaning that the first could have an interest rate of six or seven, and then the second can have an interest rate of seven, eight, nine. So if, so if it was a 20% down, it would be 20%, then a 60% for a second loan to value, and a 20% loan to value for the, for the uh, second mortgage. So it, it creates a good viable package for resale down the road. Uh, the blended rate typically is going to be 75 to 8% when it's all said and done. And, and it's affordable. It's totally yeah, affordable. yeah. I mean, for somebody who, who's not qualified and cannot get qualified, at least presently, that's, that's, that's a little pretty good. You know, it's okay. So either stay where you're at or pay the seven and a half percent, you know, or, or, you know, deal with it. And, and just, uh, you can't, you know, hold out for the three and a half percent see if you can get it. Cause you won't. So, no. so they'll pay no, the I seven, think, eight percent. I think that ship has failed. Yeah. It's gone. I mean, they're, they're in that box for a reason. So it's a function of how bad do they want the home? Yeah. And how bad do they want to get their family stabilized in a neighborhood and let their kids go to the schools they want and just, just live instead of, paying the landlord and throwing the money away. But if you look at the interest rates historically, that that's seven and a half, eight and a half, whatever percent is still a good rate. Just because we've got these artificially low rates right yeah. now, that's really not a bad rate historically. Sure. Sure. I mean when I when I bought my um house originally in oh seven uh, I think my first was uh right around six percent and my second was about eight percent. Yeah. So they're not there anymore, but, but, uh, I mean, that, that was not a bad rate. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. People are spoiled right now with the artificially low rates. Well, take advantage of it while you can. I uh, truly, that's I'm not, not going to stay there forever. That's very true. Ivan on the screen, I think you might note that I'm comparing, um, just an investment analysis of a rental uh, held as a rental or selling it as a note and getting a, a premium for the sales price. And in this particular example, and in, please interact with me as we go through. Sure. Um, if it, you know, if a home is worth 120,000, that's great. You know, they're not getting, they're not, the landlord's not going to get any more out of it. But with a, 
with selling it for a premium, they can typically get 10 to 15 percent more than what the property's worth. And again, in this example, and again, you know, this is based upon a lower price point in California. Yeah. The typical buyer is going to come in with 15, 20 percent down. In this case, 25,000. And if you if you look at this further, in comparing what the process is, the landlord is collecting $900 a month in rent. If he sells it and takes back a note, he's collecting $795. Okay, that's less money. But by the time you factor in, ex in the expenses to to his rental, he's actually less than the note. Mm. And you add in the tax refund. And the net net is when it's all said and done, the monthly cash flow on a note is better than holding it as a rental property. And the cash the, the cash on cash return is significantly higher too. You know, when you're looking at 10.13 versus 4.95%. Yeah. Um, and then with that, you know, you don't have the, the a lot of the CPA work and, and the, the just the sure. headaches connected with it, the, the property management and whatever else. So, and if you take it further out, after seven years, the difference in overall profit is it's a spread of what three hundred eighty-four dollars. It's like, is that worth the hassle? <laughs> <laughs> now, from you know, a lot of people are going to say, well, well, what about all the appreciation? Well, that might be true for a short window of time, but when you consider the variables between over a 20-year period, the average appreciation on a home is only about 3.2% a year. Hmm. Well, and, and how about this? From A question from your previous slide. And, okay. and to speak to how you can get more for your property. Okay. Now, when people are, let, let's, just, let's just use the example of somebody is eventually going to refinance out of this property. And your your sales price is one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars, but isn't that subject to especially if, if they're if it's a you know a longer or a shorter term you know say say it's two years or four years or five years now in order for the bank to lend on that money or on that property for that amount doesn't doesn't it have to appraise for the one hundred and thirty five thousand how are, how are we getting more than what it's really worth or or what they could get conventionally. Well, the, the, there's not a bank involved. This is seller financing. Right, but but if the if they there's, if the seller right. wants them to refinance through a conventional loan eventually, well, right. But you know, eventually they will have either saved up enough money to make up that difference, or the house will have appreciated enough to make up that difference as well. Or to your point, if the seller wants to encourage them to get out of it, then the seller could go ahead and just and market the note too to get their cash out or just sell a portion of the payments. Okay. And you're, and you're and you're doing fully amortized principal and interest. So potentially what's happening over the years too is is that principal balance is decreasing. That's correct. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And now you can encourage the the, the uh, buyer to want to refinance by because at the end of five years you can increase the interest rate. Mm -hmm. You can pop that interest rate from your, you know, six, seven, eight percent up to, you know, eight, nine, ten, whatever it might be, um, you know. But you can do it a maximum of two percent, so that will encourage that buyer to want to refinance. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, it's it's just a, you know, and along the way, part of a good loan officer like Pat, they will be putting that buyer into credit repair so they can. Um, refinance and it, you know, in more, in more specifically, probably put them on a strong savings plan so that they can, you know, have more money down and hopefully their job is going to be getting better, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. So it's a balancing act. And so you, you said hopefully and all these variables, right? So, so there is some speculation here and we are, we are presuming and hoping that there isn't a car accident or a disability or a death in the family or a lost job or any of those things. So what what if that worst case scenario happens and at that point now you're now you're dealing with a foreclosure proceeding or or some, something that is correct mm -hmm. yes yes the, the the irony is or the reality is in seller carry the the default rate is less in seller carry than in traditional bank financing mm -hmm. well think about it if you're the seller and you've got a buyer who has who's run into some horrible thing they lost their job but you know that they're very employable. But unfortunately, they're going to be out. They're probably be, going to be out of work for like three months. So they need some catch-up time. You could work with that as the seller if you wanted to, instead of foreclosing, and let them repair themselves and get back on track. Okay. 
But it's going back to your point, yes, if they just fall behind and just go go dark, you foreclose, you get the property back and you resell it again. Right. And now, yes, you'll lose your some cash flow and whatever, but you've still got the property. Plus it'll sell for more the next time, most likely. Right. Hmm. Based upon the economy, it'll still sell for more. So it, it it's it is a negative, but you can turn that negative into a positive by by handling it properly. Now, are you guys dealing with any properties or deal structures where there is an existing mortgage in place? You can do a wrap. Um, and the, the challenge on, especially with the FHA first, is that they don't want to allow a wrap. Correct. Um, but what you do is put a second on it. And, and, and just, you know, so the second would be, so if the FHA, current FHA is at, what, 4.5%, 5%, 3%, whatever it might be, and there could be, let's say, $70,000 in equity in the, on the back end. Mm -hmm. so you, can take, you can set up a second on that. Okay, and the reason that I asked that question is because in the event that, say, one of those situations does happen and the, the buyer defaults, now you're stuck carrying those, those underlying mortgage payments again. Correct. That's correct. That's correct. But you can also have a deed set out so that in, in the event of the buyer not following through, it could be deeded back to you, the buy, to the uh, you, the seller. Mm -hmm. You can hold that in escrow. Yeah, and then at that point, all, what you got to do is just go find another buyer. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. That's correct. But I mean, the, the odds of that happening again is less than a traditional financing. It's less than three percent in seller carry. And why why do you think that is? Well, number one, you're dealing with people that this is their last go around, their last hurrah. They don't want to let hmm. this go. Secondly, if you get a good down payment, they're not, not going to want to walk away from it. Mm -hmm. but those two uh, points are really the, the strong, the strong uh, scenario because, they, again, this is their last go around. They're not going to have another chance. They're stuck in a rental. So okay. you got, you, it's, a, it's emotional equity. A motivation I, factor of sorts. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So you know, as you as you go through the 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 um, analysis here, if you look at why a buyer would want to do this, can you see the screen here? Okay, from your side. Yes. Okay. Okay. I mean, in in this particular scenario, they were paying that buyer was paying nine hundred dollars a month in rent. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, based upon uh, taking back a, uh, their, their financing based upon ninety five thousand, their monthly payment is nine sixty four, and by the time you give them the benefit of the of uh, write offs, appreciation, principal pay down, their net benefits are five nineteen as compared to their cost of four forty four. So when they were renting. Their net out of pocket was nine hundred dollars. Right. By take by doing seller carry, they're benefiting by well close to four hundred fifty dollars. So it's it's like, which would you rather do if you were if you were a renter? Would you rather sure. rent and throw the money out the window, or would you rather have just a net cost of four forty five? So basically, it helps you improve your lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. So what you're saying is that now now I can use my monthly payments, or at least the interest portion, as a deduction, just like any other homeowner. And by doing so, you can alter the uh, withholdings on your paycheck if you're a W-2 employee and those receive a net increase in your take-home pay. Yeah, that's true. And then to your point on refinancing, they could take that additional $500 and put that towards the principal. Right. Yeah. So it, it all goes in with, you know, uh, smart planning, working with credit repair and, and setting yourself up for success down the road and, you know, having just some f uh, good financial constraints on your lifestyle. So, you know, but getting back to... Yeah, I'm still, I'm still working on that with Pete, you know, the whole the whole financial constraints and the lifestyle thing, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, he, he, he still wants those, those uh, you know, $40,000 watches and that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, so, so I just give him a number. It's just the number goes up every time. Okay, so the next year we got to make $2.5 million if you want to watch. Okay, and, and then the next the year after that, it'll, it'll increase again so that we don't, we, don't, we don't have to go buy the watch. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, but in essence, when it's, when it's all said and done, it, a, the typical seller, they're going to be getting so much, uh, such a higher rate of return. It just gives them a lot more flexibility with their life uh, in terms of what they can do. And, and Pat, could you address some of the 
issues that we're finding here with the regulatory? Well, we, the most, the one that comes to mind the most, of course, is Dodd Frank because that just came in being, it came in being enforced in January of this year. Um, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau has put some pretty uh, stiff restrictions on uh, seller carry, uh, and so you know we got we have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. but it, it has certainly created a niche in the marketplace for sure because we've got a whole lot more people who no longer qualify, and so now they are looking for seller carry. That we need to get some more sellers in the game, though. They they don't seem to um, be in tune with this. That they're right. they're trying to sell the traditional way, and the market's gotten a little flat. So, or the, or they want more than the property really is worth, and mm -hmm. they don't realize that they could actually get that price that they offered seller financing. Not to mention a nice income stream from offering seller financing. Mm -hmm. And I have one other point too. Um, the I'm not sure what, what the demographics are if you're listening audience, but I'm sure there's some realtors there. If oh, yeah. realtors would, would understand the benefits, well, here's, a, here's a real benefit for the realtor. They, typically, a realtor wants to be liked by the seller, by the buyer. They want to be the popular guy or gal. Now, in this particular scenario, after they've helped the seller to get more for their property and sell it faster, they're also helping the buyer to get in, and they're helping the seller to get a good rate of return. But more specifically, it gives the realtor additional tools for their tool belt. Now, if they're smart, they'll market for buyers for seller carry and market for sellers for seller carry. And basically, as, as Bob in Tucson says, they have an e-harmony for real estate. So <laughs> if, if you look at a, you know, which would, a, which would an agent rather make? Three percent or six percent? That's you know that's a rhetorical question. Sure. They can affect really double their income, and they'll set themselves apart from their competition. So the referral base will build, their checkbook will build. It just gives them a lot more to play with, and and they do become the hero. Mm-hmm. Not to mention they build a really nice database if they're as Dave says smart because. Every realtor that I've talked to who um, offered seller carry got swarmed with calls. So hmm. you, call, you keep all those people's contact information. The next seller that carries up comes up, whether it's yours or someone else's listing, you've got a database of buyers, and you call them up. If this is the right house for them and this is the right number for them, you call them up and say, hey, look what I just found. Come on, let's go buy it. Yeah, absolutely. And and I have uh we have another um one of our uh RIA members out there who's a who's a realtor and he he runs our RIA in Phoenix. And man, he can he could definitely use some some of this, I think. I'm not, I'm not sure if you know how well connected everybody else is out there, but I, I ought to put him in, in touch with you guys. You know, what we're doing is we're taking this to title companies and to their realtor base and, and presenting this to them just to open their eyes up that because uh, a lot of realtors out there aren't, aren't doing real well right now. Um, it's a changing marketplace, and this this will put them way ahead of their competition. And, and in terms of you know structuring the, the the given transaction, they don't have to be concerned about that. Mm -hmm. That's why you have your seller carry consultants like myself. You use attorneys. We've got a whole team of people that we work with to structure it so that there's no legal entanglements after you know after it's all said and done. But again, if it's done right. Um, the family gets their home, the seller gets out of their home, the realtor makes money, uh, the, the seller makes more money. It's just a, a win-win situation. And are you um, finding that to be one of the uh, kind of a main constraint for, for realtors and just people in general to do this? Is they just, they just are afraid of the compliance issues and they're afraid of you know, I, you know, getting, I'm not sure getting smacked. They are afraid of the compliance issues, but I think they're afraid of the unknown more than anything. They don't know mm -hmm. how to structure it. They don't know what's good, what's bad, what's indifferent. They, they don't realize that there are some really big pluses for both mm -hmm. the buyer and the seller in these transactions. Okay. So, and, and you're probably going to get to this later on, but I, I imagine that you guys hold little trainings, you know, some, some, some seminars or meetings or things like that in your area. That's true. That's true. And that's why I said we're first working with the uh, title companies. 
Uh, we're in the process of getting approved as instructors with the Arizona Department of Real Estate to put on seminars that way. Okay. Basically just opening it up. It's a whole education process because for the last 15 or 20 years, it ha there hasn't been a need. But back in the 80s and 90s, especially in the 80s, with the what, interest, rate. interest rates at 17, 18 mm percent, -hmm. was, it was a viable commodity. Sure. So, you know, that particular group, for the most part, is no longer out, out in the game. But um, those that embrace this will really win. Okay, and and Pat, just a, a question. Then how? What what is your real real role here? Are you the one who who's actually creating these new notes? Is that what you do, or, or are you working to get people qualified, or what's what's your main? You no, know, um, my particular role is to get them qualified. Okay. So we don't, neither one of us creates a note. Um, Dave will consult on creating notes so that um, when, the, when the seller meets with their attorney, they have a better idea of what's going to make a more saleable note. Okay. Um, but the, my function is to qualify the buyer for the payment so that they can't come back later and say to the seller, you are a bad guy and I want all my money back. Got it. The yeah, so you so you're doing all the due diligence as as far as here's where you are right now, here's where I think you know what what it's going to take to get you qualified down the road, and here's an action plan to to get you there. That, true, um, that's all of a part of it, but the but the most immediate thing is giving getting all the documentation regard about that buyer mm -hmm. and giving all of that documentation to the seller in case there is a problem later, where the where the buyer just turns upside down and goes, oh, you're a bad guy, Mr. Seller. Mr. Seller's got the, the evidence that he did or, the, or she did everything that they were supposed to do to qualify this person and not they were not taking advantage of them or anything like that because that's what this CFPB, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. So their goal is to protect the buyer. Okay. So you want to make sure that the documentation has been done properly, so that that buyer can't come back and say, "I didn't. I need protection." Mm. Yeah. So you so you have all the right questions on the application and and all that kind of stuff, so that you can document that file. Yes, you put you do all the due diligence on that buyer. Okay. And really, Ivan, it's no different than the traditional loan that with the well, the term they use is the Phantom A ten o three. It's the same documentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that she or other loan officers that work in this arena gather. Yeah, so it's still pretty involved. It is. I mean, it, it is, but the difference is the seller is the underwriter. That's the right. big difference. It's not the, the, the seller is the bank, the seller is the underwriter based upon the input of the loan officer. Yeah, so yeah. they can agree to really whatever kind of terms they want. Whatever they choose. Exactly. Yep. yep. So the seller is absolutely in the driver's seat. They do it or they don't do it based on the information that they are given by the loan officer. And who, and, prote who protects know, them? Just, I they guess, their attorney? To, sorry, say again? So who protects the seller to make sure that, that they're making a good choice? You, yeah, you do, and they do engage the uh, services of an attorney to draft the various documents, whether it be a land contract, contract for deed, uh, deed of trust, mortgage, you know, depending upon the jurisdiction that you're in. But yeah, they definitely go to an attorney to draft the documents. They close at a title company. The title company does a title search. I mean, it's the same scenario. It's just that it's a lot simpler and it's a lot cheaper for everybody involved. You take and you've taken the big, big bank fees out of the transaction as well. Don't forget, there's no appraisal. There, the closing mm -hmm. costs are much reduced. Um, and the and the parties are in control of the transaction. Well, and then why do you, to that effect, then why do you also need the encumbrance of having to go through a title company and the cost there? Well, the title company still got to do the title search and offer and give title insurance for the uh, for the uh, seller of the party that's taking the note back. Okay. Section. You, okay. You need to have it all legally done. Uh, you know. It, it, it's not no under the table stuff. You're you're getting uh, getting all the documentation, um, and you know I would just say also you're evaluating the risk versus the benefits. You're looking at their character, their credit, how much capital they have, their capacity to repay, and collateral. So you know it's 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 not a casual thing. It really is. Mm -hmm. 
pretty structured. It's just you're leaving out the bank. Okay. And then I guess the other benefit also is there's no 30 day escrow, right? I mean, we can, we can wrap this thing up in a week. Depending on who the parties involved are. So if there's a homeowners association that's dragging its feet, that might take a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. um, but generally once you get, once the title company does their part and the seller's gotten their package, they can just go right on to closing. Okay. And why does and even with with the HOA, Ivan, you can yeah. sort of rush in the docks, pay that fee if there's a real real need to really push the transaction along. Okay, yeah, and, and that was part of my question too: is, is what why does the HOA hold hold something up if if say I own the property outright and I want to owner finance this thing and and get a get a, get a note for myself? Why do, why is the HOA going to hold me up? Because you still got to transfer the HOA docs to the buyer. They, they're still going to want to review them. Yeah, that's, okay. that's law. They have the right to review the homeowner documents to go forward or not based okay. on that. Yeah, in case they think that their CCNRs aren't going to fit their lifestyle. Right. Yeah. yeah, or any issues, any violations, whatever, whatever, that, that could impact title later on. Yeah. And actually, the title company is going to want to make sure that the uh, HOAs, the, the docs have come through and there's no violations, or they won't be able to issue a clear title policy. Okay. So both sides are protected. Got it. So guys, if you're listening out there, the, the moral of the story is stay away from HOAs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if you're in California, you just find Ivan. He'll find you a home without an HOA and everybody will be happy. That's right. That's right. <laughs> no worries. Ruse, right? <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> See, we're about, we're about creating solutions here. See, that was an, that was an easy one for me. <laughs> it's, it's, it really is simple. It's just you just have to dumb it down and to the to the you know the, the simplest item and just walk it through. Yeah. Okay. Or talk to us and we will walk it through. <laughs> now, so um, I'm getting the sense that that we're at the end of your presentation. So you you guys are out of uh, Arizona now. So we got we got listeners all over the United States. Uh, we got listeners in other countries as well uh, that will pick up this podcast and, and uh, we'll pick it up on our website and, and, and different things. What do you say to those people? How can you help those people if they want to do these types of deals in their own states, in their own markets? Um, you know, are, are you guys going into other markets or are you guys primarily focused in, in, in Arizona? You know, what's your, what's your what's your reach out there, I guess, as, as okay. far as who you can help? To, to your point, uh, as, a, as a note carry consultant, I can do this throughout the country. The principles are all the same. Uh, I can consult with the agents. I can consult with the sellers and even the buyers, I guess, if need be. Um, is and I can I can give them for the perspective also as an agent because I am an agent. Mm -hmm. um, so I can you know, but, but the whole note side, it's it doesn't matter what state it's in. Okay. Uh, as it relates to the LO work, the loan officer work. Mm -hmm. um, I can I can very easily find a loan officer wherever that buyer is, wherever okay. that property is. I'm licensed in Arizona and California, um, but if somebody in Michigan needs a loan officer, I can find them. It's just it's uh, I have some great contacts. Have, as an age, I was an agent for many years too, okay. and so I have wonderful contacts through that where I can find LOs as well. Got it. Wherever. And Dave, are the are the as a consultant, are the, the the laws and the regulations and the different you know kind of stopping points going to be different or very much between state to state, or or is it more of a, of a federal guideline that applies everywhere? It's more of a federal. I mean, the variable might be mortgage, deed of trust, land contract, contract for deed, but that's where you bring your attorneys in. The, I'm, I'm affiliated with an attorney out of Utah. Mm -hmm. and he, I think he's licensed in probably 25 states, but beyond that, he's got affiliations throughout every state in the, in the country. Okay. So between myself, his connections, and whatever else, it's, it's a, it's a non-issue. Okay. I'm also working through. Um, a national organization, um, and we're buying non-performing notes throughout the country. So I've got that whole affiliation that I can work through to get an information that's needed to make everything uh, work smoothly. Okay, got it. Now let me see here, seeing if we have any any questions. Uh, <laughs> okay, got some got some comments here. Got some harassers on the line. That's that's not that's not atypical for us. Um, 
Okay, so we had one one comment. Standard real estate wisdom is that owner financing generates eleven times as many responses to your listing. How about that, guys? Yep. Let's see. There was a slide that said eight factors to create Dodd Frank compliant loan file, uh, but we didn't. We, yeah, we didn't hear what those eight factors are. Can you can you guys kind of go over that and touch on that a little bit? Oh, it's um, the credit, the income, the debt. Uh, the oh gosh, I think, of the I, I think I missed that slide, but Employment. somebody caught it. Yeah, we yeah. were we were talking it through as we were going. Yeah, we kind of. But but basically, debt to income ratios, uh, verification of employment, um, um, credit report, um, assets, assets. It, it's the normal. Okay, so the the main yeah do. the the regular stuff for 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 a loan. Exactly. And, and, and Ivan, what we could do on that too uh, is we we could on my website seller-carry.com. It's got all that information on it. Okay. It's got Perfect. a full dossier on what this whole pro how this whole program works, and I strongly recommend the listeners go to there and they'll they'll learn a lot. Okay. And one of the other things too is if if you're a an owner and you want to start creating these things, Dodd-Frank has a limit of three transactions per year for you. Do they not? Front words, front or back in a tw any 12 month period, front or back. So that's why you want to use a loan officer and that, uh, that, that eliminates that scenario. Okay. Because uh, unless they're a licensed mortgage originator themselves, right? That's correct. Right. That's correct. The licensed origin licensed loan originator, takes care of that, that three look back, you know, in any 12 month period. Okay. Additionally, if you have an LLC to an LLC, that's, that's totally outside the Dodd-Frank parameters. Okay. Got yeah. it. That's business to business. So that doesn't fall under Dodd-Frank. Okay. So guys, uh, now would be a good time for, for additional questions or comments if you'd like. For those of you listening to the podcast, if you want to get a hold of Dave at Capstone Capital USA, uh, you can visit their website again at seller-carry.com. Their phone number is 888-861-4292, or you can reach him by email at djfranicky at cox.net. That's djfran. E -K -C -K -I at cox.net. If you want to get a hold of Pat or have any additional questions for her, her email is pblhmr at gmail.com and her direct line is 866-229-1418. And of course, if you're listening to this and we are not connected on Facebook yet, make sure you check out our website at c2crea.com and you can find our connect with us tab there and that has all the links to all my social media uh, profiles, um, as well as um, email and, and you know basically every every way to to, to reach me, uh, it's probably easiest to reach me via text message or Facebook message because I get those right away. Sometimes uh, my emails do get piled up, uh, and I respond to those in the order that they were received. Typically, unless unless I know there's something urgent that's coming through. So, any questions, guys? Let me know. Uh, Dave, Pat, any any last words or remarks? Yeah, I guess the market is changing. Uh, financing is can be challenging for buyers. This is something that should not be shy away from. It's a it's a positive event. Embrace it because I, there's a lot of value here for everybody involved. Perfect. Yeah, I, I agree with it. And the more extra strategies, the better. Especially if you, if you're an investor, right? Exactly. Oh, really? Yep. Exactly. I always want to make the make the best of your investment for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for your time, Dave and Pat. Um, we'll, we'll get this process as recording over to you guys and, and a link to, so you can share it with your people as well. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to them directly or let me know and I'll put you in contact with them. Thanks so much for being here with us, guys, spending a little over an hour of your Thursday afternoon. Go enjoy the heat and, and the summer and, and uh, your families. Have a great time. Go make something happen. And remember, Become allergic to average because if you want to get anywhere in life, you can't settle for what's average, for what the masses want you to, to accept. And, and that's why we bring people like this to you who are stepping outside of the box or finding out new creative ways, changing with the marketplace. And as the marketplace moves, we got to move with it in order to stay competitive in our, market, in our space. So that's what we're all about. You can check out all our resources on our website, all our past web, uh, 
podcasts, webinars, radio shows. We do six webinars a week now, guys, on different topics with different guests and different um, uh, hosts as well. So make sure you check out all those free resources and support so you can take action and change your lives. Really, I mean, that's that's what we're all about. We're agents for change. So thanks again, guys. It's uh, you know always sad to say goodbye, but farewell, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you.